Okay, so welcome everyone to the ICTS String Seminar. Today we are very happy to have uh, Alex Bellin from CERN telling us about quantum gravity meets statistical physics. So Alex, please take it away. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Victor. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be giving this talk today. Uh, I've actually never been to ICTS. It would have been nice to come in person, but uh, we have to be a little bit patient for that. Um, so today, what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell you about some work that I've been doing over the last, uh, say, year and a half um, with, with Jan de Boer at the University of Amsterdam and Pranjal Nayak and Julian Sonner, who are at the University of Geneva, and also Diego Liska and Tarek Anous, who are both also at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and the talk is going to be based on uh, three papers that are already out, um, as well as two papers uh, that should come out soon, one hopefully by the end of the week and the other by, by the end of the month. Uh, and so really the, the question that we've been, we've been trying to understand is, you know, what is semi-classical gravity? What is semi-classical general relativity? And um, I think, you know, the sort of most natural answer that, that we would give is, well, it, it's an effective field theory. It's an effective field theory for a more complete theory uh, of quantum gravity. Um, for example, it could be the low energy effective field theory of string theory that's valid at long distances. Um, and, you know, the most sort of standard thing that you would do with a low energy effective field theory um, is, is you know, take the metric, expand it around a maximally symmetric space, flat space, or maybe more relevant for this talk, anti the sitter space. Uh, and then you would compute, you know, few point scattering amplitudes uh, of, of the, the perturbative gravitons. No, oh, and then if you were more fancy, you could, you know, compute loops uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and from the point of view of, of, of the quantum dual, what you would be really computing is, you know, few point correlation functions uh, of, of, you know, simple operators, say single trace operators. Um, in particular, this would be like a four point function of the stress tensor. Okay, and, and that's sort of the, 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 the simplest thing you can do with, with semi-classical gravity is expand it around a symmetric background and compute few point scattering amplitudes or, or few point conformal correlation functions. Uh, but of course, you know, we, we think that, that, that gravity knows a, a lot more, um, and we've known that for decades now, and what gravity knows about is black holes. Uh, so when you talk about black holes, we're now talking about a different sector of the theory. We're talking about, you know, energies, uh, say in n equals to four super young mills, energies that scale with n squared. Um, and the spectrum of the, of the CFT uh, on those energy scales is, is extremely complicated, right? You, you can think about it as some crazy pattern like this. Uh, think about it as some, some very complicated barcode. Um, and so, you know, that's what, the, that's what the energy levels very schematically look like. Um, and there's other, um, there's other pieces of the dynamical information. Uh, for example, uh, we can talk about, um, you know, matrix elements of operators in these energy eigenstates. This is a matrix, let's call it RM, RMN. It's parameterized by the choice of operator O that we picked. And similarly, this is a very complicated matrix. I can't even uh, imagine uh, writing it here for you, but you should think as some very, very complicated matrix with, with, with compli complicated numbers, okay? Uh, and so this is the microscopic information. This is what we think the microscopic of information of n equals to four super young mills at strong coupling looks like. Um, and you can ask, you know, what part of that information does semi-classical gravity have access to? Uh, and, you know, some of this has been known for, I don't know, five decades now. Um, and, and it's just given by the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for black hole entropy. Um, so, you know, you can compute, you can look at a black hole of a, of a certain mass, compute uh, the area of its horizon over 4G Newton, and that gives you the entropy. Um, and so you can ask, you know, what is that in terms of the, of the microscopic data? Well, it's not, the, 
it's not the individual eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, the actual energy levels. What it does is says, okay, well, um, you know, it counts in some band of energy how many states there are, right? And in this band, there's e to the s states. Uh, and of course, once you have uh, the black hole background, what you can do is go and compute correlation functions on that black hole background. Um, you know, something like this, or you could compute, say, one point functions. Like this. Um, and similarly, this gives you uh, some coarse grain information about the nature of these matrix elements here. Okay, so both at the level of the entropy and at the level of the matrix elements, uh, gravity knows something about this. It's not just an effective field theory that works at, at small scaling dimensions. It knows something about scaling dimensions of order n squared, uh, but it's coarse grain information. It counts the overall number of states in some bands, um, and it knows something about coarse grain information of these matrix elements uh, when you sample many of them together. Um, and, and, you know, already here, it, it's worth pausing and noticing that this is already quite remarkable, right? If I just hand you n equals to four super Yang mills uh, at strong coupling, there's no way for you to calculate the actual eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, and there's no way for you even to count how many of those energy eigenstates there are in a given energy window. So this is very complicated information from the point of, from, from the point of view of the CFT. Uh, but uh, it's something that gravity has access to. And I'm noticing that because I transitioned to my laptop, uh, I will get disconnected soon if I don't plug in my charger. So let me just do that. Sorry about that. The Zoom gods have spoken once again. There we go. So, um, so you know, this is already quite remarkable that, that gravity have, has access to this. Of course, this is just black hole thermodynamics, say, applied to ADS-CFT. So we're, we've known it for a long time. Uh, and I think, you know, for many years, we would have said, well, well, this is it. That's the only thing that, that, that gravity has access to. And, you know, um, all the, the more fine-grained information about the energy eigenstates or the matrix elements, gravity is just blind to that. We'll never, more, we'll never know more than uh, what's on this slide. And sort of the, the surprise that's come out of the last few years is that in fact, gravity seems to know a lot more. And the sort of picture that I'm gonna try to convince you of today is that you know, really semi-classical uh, general relativity is the statistical theory of this microscopic information. Okay, that's really going to try to, that's really going to be the main message of this talk today. Now, as I said, you know, uh, part of this has been known for a long time. This is just black hole thermodynamics. So the types of things that I uh, wrote down before, the correlation functions on the black hole background or the entropy tell you about certain statistical distributions of these energy eigenstates. But the new part of the story, what's become clear over the last few years, uh, is that actually there's other types of configurations that you have access to thanks to semi-classical GR that tell you about more fine-grained property of the energy spectrum and the matrix elements. And that's related to Euclidean wormholes. So, you know, I could draw a bunch of different types of gravitational configurations. These would be Euclidean wormholes in 3D gravity. You can also have wormholes in 2D gravity. Uh, and you can put correlation functions on these wormholes. Uh, and then being able to compute these types of observables gravitationally gives you more refined information, higher moment information about the distribution of the energy eigenstates uh, and the matrix elements. Okay? And so gravity is not a theory about ever computing the actual eigenvalues all these very fine-grained numbers or these very detailed matrix elements. But what it can do and seem to be able to do it in quite a lot of detail is give you the moments uh, of the distribution of these numbers. Okay, that will be sort of the main punchline that I'll try to convince you of in this talk.
so, so yeah, I like have a question here. Could you have got the moments also just by, uh, you know, computing correlation functions? So um, indeed, if you compute a higher point function um, at finite temperature, you will get certain moments, but they'll look like this. Right? So there'll, there'll be higher moments with certain cyclic trace structure contractions. Um, and you know, you're also allowed to ask the question, you know, what's the what's the fourth moment just of this number itself? Right, not cyclically contracted with anything else, and this is not something that is that you obviously have access to in a you know k point function. I see. Okay. You know, so so it, let's think about these all as different variables. This is sort of like you know the x y z u type moment, and this is the x to the fourth moment. Um, I see. And so and you know. You, you kind of need multiple Euclidean boundaries to probe the most general type of moment you want. I see. Okay. I think that's the, the sort of short answer. Also, I guess uh, the thing is that for strong coupling theories, the moments will, uh, can, can they be calculated for even for strong coupling theories? Sorry, I, I can't hear you very well. Can the moments be calculated even for strong coupling theories? From, from the CFT side? Or from the theory, yeah, on the CFT side. No, no, on the CFT side, you can't even compute. That's what I was saying. On the CFT side, you can't even compute the first moment, right? Yeah. Computing this e to the s directly in the CFT, nobody knows how to do that. Yeah, so that's why the gravity side is needed. Yeah, so, so the gravity side is needed, but but sort of the point here is that, you know, the gravity side can compute the first moment of the density of states, but but actually also the higher moments. That's, that's the surprise. Uh, so, 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 sorry to bug, bug, bug you on this a little bit, but let's say we, we wrote down some Schwinger Kellish correlator with insertions of e to the minus beta h and so on. Is it still true you can't get these rmn to the power of four? I mean, I haven't thought about it in detail, but is it the case that if you just write down you know, some trace with whatever insertions you like and a few correlators, you can never get these kinds of moments? Is that the statement? Yeah, I think it'll be very hard to isolate it isolate it. Um, I, I don't think it's, I mean, it's maybe more more clear at the level of the density of states, right? Uh, how are you going to isolate the, the two point function of the density of states? Um, Wait, you mean like EN squared? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like row of EN, row of EM. I would put in some insertions of the Hamiltonian or e to the minus beta h and maybe that would give me some information about that. Yeah, so what you'll be able to do is, for example, from a thermal two point function at Lorentzian time separation, you're going to you're going to you're going to be able to know about. Um, uh, sorry, O M N squared. This is the type of information that you would get from a two point function. I see. So you're going to get joint information between rho of E N and rho of E M weighted by the matrix elements. I see. But if you really completely want to isolate it rho itself, you kind of need two boundaries to do that. I see. OK. OK, thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Those are great questions. Yeah, I should have said this. Please ask many questions. I, the talk is a bit open-ended. I'll fill it up with the time that we have. And it doesn't need to go somewhere very precise. So please interrupt me as much as you want. Uh, sorry, Alex. Sorry, Alex. Yeah. So, so just to come back on this. So isn't it true that if you know all correlation function, it's equivalent to like knowing all the eigenvalues? Microscopically, yes. So no, no, I, I should also say that. So if you were able to compute all the correlation functions, uh, you know, on all genus, uh, all, say for 2D CFT, this was proven by Cyborg and Moore, you know, if you know the correlation functions on all genus G surfaces, then you know oh. the theory exactly. But you know, that for, for, for you to make that statement requires you knowing the microscopic correlation function, right? Uh, you know, to say it differently, if you already know all the energy levels exactly, then you know the spectrum, and you know yeah. there's there's nothing more that that you will learn. But the point is that you know observables of, of, of these type, uh, they don't compute really the microscopic information. They they give you coarse grain information. Yeah, yeah, but then it seems it's not clear what the wormhole gives in addition to the correlation function. It gives the higher <laughs> moments of the statistical distribution. 
No, but if you know all the eigenvalues, you already have everything, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. But the point is that when we compute the partition function in gravity, we don't compute that individual. We don't compute it at the level of knowing all the individual eigenvalues, right? We don't. We don't compute this. That's not what we compute. With we don't know the all the ENs yeah. separately. I, I, I you know, we compute the free energy. It's a smooth function of temperature. That's what we compute. That doesn't tell you what the individual row of EN. I, I think what Alex is saying is that you know if you use correlation functions like low point correlators, we'll never compute more than say 10 point correlators. Then you know, usually correlators would give you some moments, but by considering these multi-boundaries, you can get like more moments than you would have got just by considering a single boundary. So, you know, you, you we are never talking about like arbitrarily high point correlators, but just low point correlators. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's actually, gonna say you have access to more, more information than you would have otherwise. If I understood correctly. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Great, uh, so, so you can add, why is this remarkable? Or what does it buy you? Uh, and and this is related to the information loss uh, paradox, uh, and or more, or maybe to say it differently, it's related to information recovery in some sense. So uh, there's a very nice quantity that people in quantum chaos like to talk about, which is similar to the, which is very similar to the um, thermal two point function. In Lorentzian time, which is called the spectral form factor, it's the square of the partition function uh, analytically continued uh, in temperature. And this is what this quantity uh, behaves like. Uh, it starts off by a decay uh, due to the phase interference, um, and then it starts at some point to have crazy erratic oscillations. Okay, and this is known on very general grounds. You can take a chaotic spin chain, put it on your computer and, and you'll produce, or take the SYK model, you'll, you'll produce a graph like this. Um, and if you try to compute this, this quantity just using you know, semi-classical gravity and the black hole background, what you'll find is that you know, you'll get the first part correctly, you'll get the decay correctly, uh, but then it'll just go to zero. Okay, and that's incompatible uh, with um, having a discrete spectrum in the quantum mechanical world. Okay, and this is what Maldasena called uh, a version of the information paradox, uh, say 20 years ago. Okay, but the, 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 the recent progress that was noticed in this paper by Satchenker and Stanford is that if you include, so in 2D gravity, if you now include a wormhole uh, contribution, um, that'll give you, so in this erratic signal, there's sort of a mean part of the signal, which is a linearly growing ramp. Uh, and then there's a plateau. Uh, and what Satchenker and Stanford found is that if you include this wormhole that connects the two boundaries, so here the two boundaries are the two are the two circles, here and here. Uh, if you include this wormhole, you get the ramp. And you know the fact that the signal doesn't go to zero is really so. You know, in some sense, to fully solve the information paradox in this context, you need to be able to reproduce all the crazy erratic oscillations. Uh, gravity can't do that, but what can gravity can do is show that it doesn't go to zero and that it starts rising again with a ramp and it, it knows that because there's wormhole contributions. Okay, so this is some form of information recovery. Although I, know, I don't think we could really call, call it information at this stage, but it's showing you that the signal does indicate to zero. Um, and it's, it's extremely powerful because this ramp is related to eigenvalue repulsion. It's a universal feature of quantum chaotic many body systems. Um, and it's related to eigenvalue repulsion of nearby eigenvalues. Okay, and it really has to do with discreteness of the spectrum. And so the remarkable, the remarkable fact is that, um, you know, Somehow, semi-classical gravity, um, even though it can't compute the individual eigenvalues, can still compute something that has a memory uh, that, that knows about the fact that the eigenvalues are discrete and want to repel. Okay, and this is really this is really remarkable, and this is why knowing the higher moments is useful. So, you know, the, the statement is that you know, rho of E n, rho of E m, the two-point function of the spectral density goes like E n minus E n squared. Okay, that's what the ramp is telling you. 
And so that's why you need the second moment uh, of the density of states uh, to probe something like eigenvalue repulsion. Uh, and it's really remarkable that gravity uh, knows something about this. Semi-classical gravity knows something about this. Hi, Alex. Yeah, hi. Hey, how's it going? Hi, good. Uh, I remember from a long time ago, there were papers by uh, uh, Damur, Solodukin, and others who were uh, taking such wormhole type geometry. I mean, they didn't have a solution for that, but they had a geometry with some throat and uh, they showed that the thermal two point functions, they don't vanish at long times, but rather shows the small oscillations. Um, and they were um, kind of relating it to, um, once again, this information recovery. Uh, so how are those studies different from these studies? Uh, I'm not really familiar with the, the paper that you're mentioning. Um, so it, I guess the details- yeah, so this was a time when, uh, so the, this Maldasena talked about this thermal two point functions and decay and then small fluctuations, right? This mm -hmm. uh, eternal black hole paper. And then there were, uh, papers which talked about, like, I think, Kleban, Purati, uh, so they kind of tried to sum over some uh, saddle points in ADS-3. Uh, I forgot the uh, year, actually. And then there were these uh, wormhole uh, suggestions by Damur Solodukin. I can send you, uh, I can send you the- Yeah, return. I'd be happy to send me the paper. I, I don't know about the wormhole part of the story. If you just do the usual sum over saddle points of single- No, no, no. So, yeah. So usual that will not be enough. saddle points were shown to be incompatible. Yes. Uh, and then you actually do need wormhole type solutions. Yeah, I see. So, okay. So, yeah, send me the references. I'd be curious in, in, in seeing what they say. Maybe it's connected to this. Um, okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So it, it's remarkable, but there's actually a price to pay. Uh, and, and the price to pay is known as the factorization puzzle. And in fact, you know, way before realizing that use that wormholes were very useful, uh, we were very confused about wormholes, Euclidean wormholes. Um, and the reason for that is if you try to compute the products uh, of you know, the partition functions of two CFTs on disconnected Euclidean manifolds uh, that I'm gonna uh, label by Euclidean time beta one or um, sorry, Euclidean uh, circle size beta one and beta two, and you try to evaluate that in gravity, well, what are you supposed to do? You fix the boundary condition. So you have two boundaries with circle size beta one, beta two, and then you sum over all the geometries that fill in uh, in the bulk smoothly. So you're gonna have geometries with the topology of the disc or what we would call maybe the cigar um, in higher dimensions, uh, which are disconnected, but you also have um, solutions uh, which connect the two boundaries. These are the Euclidean wormholes. This is like the double cone geometry that I was drawing on the previous slide. And so if you compute this in gravity, well, you're gonna get some function of beta one and beta two. Uh, and because of the red geometry here, it's not gonna be given by some other function, some factorized function of beta one and beta two, okay? Uh, and this is puzzling because you know the the product of CFT partition functions uh, just obviously factorizes, and so um, there seems to be a, a mismatch. And so this was known as the factorization puzzle, and sort, was sort of left aside for many years actually, um, and only revisited more recently now that we understood that actually the wormholes are useful. Uh, and so because of this puzzle um, and or more sophisticated versions of it, people have argued that you know that means that. Uh, gravity, the, the, the dual of gravity is an average theory. Uh, it's an average over some kind, it's an average over CFTs or an average over Hamiltonians. Uh, also, I guess, pushed by the fact that for JT gravity, the dual is a matrix model or for the SYK, there is explicit disorder averaging. Uh, but, but I wanna take a, a different perspective today. So there's gonna be no averaging over theories. Um, and really, you can understand this from the perspective of quantum chaos. Okay. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try to give you a form, framework that can explain why uh, this factorization puzzle. Um, and it's related to you know, resolving just the moments of the erratic signals, but not uh, resolving the signals themselves. Okay. Uh, so, so let me give you a, a plan for the rest of the talk. 
And as I said, uh, this is pretty open-ended. So if I, if I don't get uh, to say it all, it's perfectly fine. So this was my introduction. Uh, I'm gonna start by reviewing uh, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis um, and tell you how it applies to conformal field theories. I'll then introduce something which is called the OP randomness hypothesis, which is a sort of extension of the ETH uh, for CFTs uh, and, and then discuss its applications and some evidence for it. Uh, and then we'll finish with some open questions if there's time. Uh, but before I dive in, let me just maybe ask if there's some, some questions about, about my introduction. Okay, it doesn't seem like it, so I can get started. So um, as I said, there's sort of two parts of dynamical data in, in quantum systems. There's uh, you know, the, the, the energy levels, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, and then there's matrix elements of operators. Uh, and in this talk today, I'm really gonna focus on matrix elements of operators. Uh, and the natural language uh, from a quantum chaos point of view to talk about uh, operator statistics is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Uh, so let me review uh, what ETH is for those of you that are not familiar. So it says that if you take a simple operator O, um, simple operator means few bodies. So if you imagine looking at a chaotic spin chain, it would be an operator that only has support on a few of the spins. Uh, and you compute its matrix elements in energy eigenstates. Uh, that there's a completely universal structure uh, for these matrix N elements that are true in all quantum chaotic systems. Okay? And the structure that there's a diagonal piece uh, with a smooth function uh, of the average energy E bar. And then uh, there's an erratic piece uh, with another smooth function of the mean energy and the energy difference uh, that's exponentially smaller uh, in the entropy. Okay, so let me tell you just what all of these things are. So, you know, E, e bar is the average energy. Uh, delta E is the energy difference. Um, F and G are smooth functions. Smooth functions. Uh, and they're related to the microcanonical one and two point functions of the operator. One and two point function uh, of O. Uh, and RMN, they're often referred to as Gaussian, independent Gaussian random variables uh, with you know, mean zero and unit variance. Independent Gaussian random variables with mean zero and variance one. Okay, so what the ETH is telling you is that if you look at these H matrix elements, there's gonna be large contributions on, along the diagonal given by the microcanonical one point function. And then on the off diagonal terms, you're gonna have sort of erratic numbers. These are the RMN um, wrapped in an envelope, which is, as I said, exponentially smaller in the entropy with another smooth function, which is basically this envelope, okay? And you know what the function F and G are uh, and what the entropy is, those are all theory dependent things. Uh, but the structure is completely universal. You know, it's true whether you take uh, uh, you know, a chaotic spin chain, n equals to four super young mills, the SYK model, um, you study nuclear physics, any, any, any system that has quantum chaos, some uh, the ETH and this is expected to hold. Okay. Uh, but there's two comments that I wanna make about, about the ETH that are important. Uh, the first one is that these RMNs, they're not actually random. In any fixed theory with a fixed Hamiltonian, you know, in principle, you can put it on your computer, diagonalize it, and you just solve what the RMNs are. Okay. So they're not actually random. When we mean what we mean by saying that they're Gaussian random variables is that really, you know, there's many of them. This is assembled in some big, big matrix, and there's this there's a statistical distribution of them. And if you start sampling over many of the, of, the, um, of the matrix elements, what you'll see is that they have a distribution which is approximately Gaussian random with mean zero and unit variance, okay? So um, there's no, 
really good word for that. I, I like to call them pseudo random, meaning that they're fixed in any theory, but they have a statistical uh, distribution over them. Uh, but it's important to know that they're not actual random. We don't integrate or average over them. Okay, they're fixed. They're, they're fixed, but they have a statistical distribution. Um, the second important comment is that actually RMN uh, uh, are neither Gaussian nor independent. And this is really not emphasized enough, but it's, it's quite important. Uh, and this was, this was uh, shown in a very nice paper by Fuani and, and, and Kirchan. Um, and, and you know the fact that if you have a non-trivial four-point function, uh, that implies that the RMNs are sort of the connected. So this goes back to the question that Suvret was asking earlier about these higher moments. But it shows that you know, the connected quartic moment uh, of the OPE coefficients cannot be zero if there's a non-trivial four-point function. So in other words, often people in ETH, they care about one and two-point functions. That's why they say that they're Gaussian. Um, but when you start caring about higher point function, consistency tells you that there has to be non-trivial quartic moments. Okay, And I should emphasize that even if your quantum system is uh, something like n equals to four super young mills, which is a generalized free theory, uh, if you look at generalized free fields, so all the wick contractions on a black hole background, that still requires non-trivial quartic corrections because you get some of the wick contractions, but not all of them, if you assume that the operators are Gaussian. Okay, so even if in the sort of simplest theory where there's actually approximate free fields, you still need non-trivial quartic uh, interactions. Uh, but the important part is that if you, you also can figure out how big the case moment is. So if you look at the size of the case moment, uh, it's given by the following formula, okay? Which means that it's, as you go up in moments, it's further and further exponentially suppressed in the entry. Okay, so the, the Gaussian distribution is, is, is a good approximation because the higher moments are suppressed. That's really what's important. The RIJs are never Gaussian, but they're approximately Gaussian with higher moments being further suppressed exponentially in the entry. That's really how you should think about it. And again, uh, so, so I didn't understand this part. Uh, if you take like, if you put k equal to four here, you, you, you'd you say you'd get e to the minus three by four s. Yeah. But uh, the four point function is not suppressed by a factor of e to the minus s, right? It could be just something yes. derivative. Yes, uh, very good. So the point is that, you know, this is the, the end of, this is the size of that higher moment in individual coefficients. I see, but and you sum. When you sum over, then there's more intermediate sums, which can lead to competing or same size of values. Fine, okay, thank you. Uh, thank but, you. But, it, but you know, if you really try to subtract out the second moment from the, from the two point from Rij, you would be left with another matrix, which, net, which is now further exponentially suppressed. So the net contribution to the higher moments is down, even though they can have same or competing effects in correlation. Fine, fine, thank you. Uh, so, so maybe just one thing, usually the ETH is written with an explicit factor of e to the minus s by two, and you're saying that kind of doesn't make sense for the higher moments, is that right? Uh, yeah, well, ETH you did, is- oh, you, you did write it with e to the minus s by two, including this factor of e to the minus s by two, you're saying the higher moments are still down. Uh, well, I mean, the, so the second moment is of size e to the minus s by two, which is what people write here. Yes. Uh, but really there's like, there's kind of like a plus dot, dot, dot. And then that dot, dot, dot would be e to the minus three s over four. Uh, now, my, my question is if you normalize the RMNs as you've normalized them here with this yeah. normalization, uh, is it it's still true that the higher moments are suppressed with e to the minus? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah no, sorry. The, the e to the minus, it's not a relative suppression. So, you know, the second moment is of size e to the minus s over two. The, the fourth one is e to the minus three s over four. I see. So the relative suppression between them is like e to the minus s over four. Something like okay. That. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. These are great questions. I can ask a question. Yes, please. So, since, since everything's fixed by three point functions, shouldn't the three point moments of RMN completely give everything? Uh, I didn't. As in, as in if, if I have a three point function of all the O's, all the yeah. data are fixed, right? So, shouldn't the three point moment of RMNs completely give me the uh, distribution of RMNs over to it? Uh, I could take the ETH oh. and such and I mean, take a product among operators and that would fix the moments. 
Oh, oh, you're asking about doing the OPE in the CFT because right. at the end right. of the, is that yes. what you're saying? You're saying there's yes, a yes, yes, yes. No, so this is an excellent question. This is something that I think is very fun that hasn't been studied. Uh, and so the OPE sort of constrains, you know, the structure of ETH, right? Like, you know, very roughly speaking, we want to write something like O1 R N P O2 uh, goes to like C O1 O2 O3 R uh, M P O3 or something like that, right? Very roughly speaking, um, you you can imagine uh, doing what you say, fusing with the OP, and that that should constrain all these elements together. And this has not been systematically studied, but I think it's a very interesting question. So you know, if you had full power of the if, if you had full power of the of the CFT, you should be able just from two and three point functions to figure out all the R's in some sense, because it, it is constrained by the OP. But no, and, nobody's nobody's figured out how to do that. And, and is there any hint to that from the wormhole picture picture in the gravity side, like that uh, three wormhole should three boundary wormhole or something should give you all the everything in any sense? Okay. No, that's also a good question. I haven't thought about that really. How to? I think I would want what I, what I would want to do is before even considering wormholes, which are about more refined moments of the R's, uh, I would just want to try to understand just this just this thing in the black hole background itself. The wormholes, uh -huh. I would say, is a sort of complication on top of this. Uh -huh. But I was you know, just wondering, is standard it... ETH? You could ask, how do we take into account some statement that you can construct all the wormholes by studying pair of pants or something like gluing pair of pants. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a maybe there's a sort of pair of pants. Uh, point. I don't know. Okay. It would be interesting to think about it more. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so 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 that was really. I think that's 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 the two important messages to take away from ETH is that things are not actually random they're fixed but they have a statistical distribution and that really it's not gaussian but it's approximately gaussian with higher moments of rest uh and this was all about you know generic quantum system uh, oh just yes. wanted to clarify so yes. um if you don't know that a system is chaotic then i guess uh the eth would be a diagnostic for that if the system, you know, like, like, are, can we say that all chaotic systems satisfy the ETS? Yeah, so that, that goes to, that's another great question of really, you know, what we mean by quantum chaos. Mm -hmm. Certain people, and I, I, I'm, I've been among them in the past, and I probably still am today, can take the ETH ANSATS as uh, a definition of quantum chaos. Mm -hmm. Probably the, 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 you know, the, the, the most, Correct thing to say is that you know if you have a spectral form factor that looks like this green curve here, then your theory is chaotic. You know, it's it should really be formulated probably at the level of, uh, you know, the the statistics of the energy eigenvalues, and then what one would hope to be able to show uh, that the ETH follows from this. Okay, I, I'll mention something related to that later on in the talk when I try to give evidence for the ORH, there's a form of the ETH that you can kind of prove assuming random matrix theory, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not the full, it's not the full ETH in some sense. So, yeah. so starting from the, the ETH does not necessarily imply um, like eigenvalue repulsion? Nobody has shown that. It probably does, but I think nobody, yeah, it hasn't been shown. Right. And, and I should say ETH is not proven by the way, ETH is a conjecture. People have studied it numerically in spin chains and SYK model. It always seems to be true. So it's wildly believed, but there's no proof of it. Um, right. And it's also not really known exactly how it interacts or clashes with, uh, with you know, the theory being chaotic. It, it's probably equivalent, but that also has not been proven. Yeah. Okay, thanks. We can, let's just say for the remaining of the talk today, let's just take it as our definition of what quantum chaos is. That'll be, that'll be good enough. Thanks. Uh, okay, so this was all about general quantum systems, uh, but I want to talk about conformal field theories because I care about holography. Uh, so, so what happens to ETH and CFTs? Uh, and there's a couple of things to say. So, you know, if we take our, our our simple operators, our probes to be just local operators, then the statement of ETH, because of the state operator correspondence, so I can rewrite this uh, as uh, a three-point function in the vacuum which is nothing else than an OPE coefficient. Uh, 
So what ETH is in CFTs is really a statement about the statistics of OPE coefficient. Um, and it's important to know that this OPE coefficient is not any OPE coefficient between three operators because ETH is always in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, the scaling dimensions of the operators ON and OM really go to infinity. Uh, whereas the scaling dimension of the operator O is fixed. Okay, uh, so in, in some language that's used often, this is really a statement about light, heavy, heavy, or light, heavy, heavy prime OPE coefficient. That's what ETH is saying, is that there's a certain statistical distribution to this OPE coefficient. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind, which will not be very important for this talk, uh, but it's, it's worth saying it, is that uh, ETH should only apply to primaries. It's very easy to show that uh, descendants violate the ETH, you know, because, uh, you know, if you look, if you look at the, if you look at one descendant level, that's like an off-diagonal matrix element. But of course, the OPE coefficient between the primary and its descendant is very simply related, and it's not at all exponentially suppressed. Uh, so it's clear that ETH will never work if you apply it to all operators, and you should really only ever apply it to primaries. And this becomes particularly subtle in two D, where there's zero zero symmetry, but we should there again only apply it to zero zero primary. Sorry, why why should delta N M B uh, go to infinity? Oh, it's because we're really thinking about the thermodynamic limit. So, um, you know, we're, if you want to, so really operators create energy eigenstates on the sphere, on the D minus one dimensional sphere, but we're interested in the thermodynamic limit where the sphere is going, is becoming very, very, very large with a finite energy density, which means in practice that the scaling dimensions are going to infinity. You know, that, that's the equivalent of like V goes to infinity uh, with uh, E over V fixed or something. That's why. So it's it, it's it's really because it, it, ETH should be understood as a statement about the thermodynamic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, Alex, but shouldn't it be uh, light primaries? Uh, yeah. So so you know, in a generic CFT that's chaotic, what you mean by light and heavy? So so delta O should be fixed. That's what's important now. In, okay. you know, things become more subtle when you have a large NCFT because now you have another parameter N that enters. Um, and in that case, yes, we should take, let's take O to be fixed as N goes to infinity and as delta N and M go to infinity. So it should be a light operator. There's this subtle thing in gravity that there's a second thermodynamic limit that you can take where, you know, you don't take the energy to infinity, you take the energy to go with N squared and then you take N to infinity. That's not an infinite volume limit. That's a large n limit. It's also thermodynamic, but things behave a bit differently. For example, Mike, like the, the equivalence of the different ensembles is no longer true when you do something like that. So it's a bit it's a bit subtle. And for this talk today, I'd rather talk about the standard thermodynamic limit. Um, but yes, for large n theories, let's just take delta O to have a scaling dimension of order one. Great. Uh, okay. But of course, in, in CFTs, there's other types of OPE coefficients, right? Uh, you can have, you know, O, O, N, or L, M, N, right? This is like light, C, light, light, heavy, uh, C, heavy, 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 okay? So what about those? What does quantum chaos have, have to say about those? And so this is what led us to make the OP randomness conjecture with Yan. Um, Assuming that, you know, for very heavy, complicated microscopic operators, it should be very, very hard to distinguish them. Um, so if you can't distinguish them, might, might as well treat them approximately randomly. Uh, and so this is what led us to the OP randomness hypothesis. Okay, um, which I'll call ORH in the rest of the talk, which says that in a chaotic CFT, Um, also, C O O N and C L M N uh, are random variables, are pseudo random variables. Um, you know, with, with an approximately Gaussian distribution. And note that unlike the ETH, so there's also C O N M, 
this is just ETH. So you can view the ORH uh, hypothesis as a generalization to ETH that affects also other types of OPE coefficients. Um, and, um, and, you know, there's a, there is a, one difference with the ETH is that in ETH, there's a large diagonal part. Um, and for these, for these other types of OPE coefficients, there's not. So, you know, this thing is really like a RM and this thing is really like a RLMN. And there's no delta MN, there's no diagonal piece here. Okay, so, so that's the proposal. It's, it's a conjecture. Um, so, so, sorry, there's something I lost track of. Uh, yeah. You emphasized earlier that the RMNs were not Gaussian because you had a four point function. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe you explain this, but is there, is there no, why is there no, uh, you know, uh, are you, is it clear there's no similar argument one can make for the OP? No, no, there, there is, sorry. So it's approximately Gaussian. So it's the same, th it's the same thing. And actually right. that's some of the evidence that I'll show is Excellent. that the higher moments here as well, you know, are, exp are they're non-zero, they have to be non-zero by consistency. But they're exponentially suppressed in entropy. So it's, okay. it's the same thing. So it's approximately Gaussian in the same Thank sense. As well. Yeah, thanks. Very good. Um, how am I doing with time? I'm, I'm probably really behind, right? Yeah, I have like 15 minutes left. OK. Uh, no, but it's OK. There's been a lot of discussion. So it, it, I don't know how, how much time do you need? No, no, it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. And then when time has stopped, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of stop. And we'll see where you want to go with questions or whatever. It's fine. Like I said, it's a bit open ended. Okay, um, sure. So let me tell you, why, why would we care about these things? And for the rest of the talk, I'll mostly be talking about the heavy, heavy, heavy ones. Uh, you, you, you know, why are these important? And they're important because there's other types of probes of quantum chaos um, that, you know, don't have a sort of very natural or direct counterpart in quantum mechanics. So there's, there's, there seem to be some questions that you can ask in CFTs uh, where you need to know the statistical behavior of CLMN that you would never have thought to ask in quantum mechanics. And the simplest example of that is in 2D CFTs, the genus two partition function, uh, which looks like this. So it involves like a bolt. So this is a very simple slice of moduli space where all three moduli of the genus two surface are the same. Um, and what it looks like is a Boltzmann, Boltzmann sum weighted by you know, three energies. So it's a sum over triplets of energies. Uh, with a Boltzmann factor for all three energies weighted by the OPE coefficients. Okay, that's what the genus two partition function is. Um, and it's an, it's an observable in 2D CFTs that you can, that you can compute. Uh, but once you have something like that, it's very natural to, to define the genus two spectral form factor, right? Which is just Z of beta plus IT. Uh, so, Call that f of t. So this is a quantity that you can define. It's going to be a probe of chaos. It'll be sensitive to the discrete nature of energy eigenstates. It, it involves six sums over states. So it's like a six point moment of rho, uh, but it's weighed in by the quartic moment of OPE coefficients. Okay. And, and so, okay, it's, it's probably clear that this is going to be very interesting from a quantum chaos point of view. Uh, but you know, it's a question that we would have not known how to ask in quantum mechanics. It doesn't have a natural counterpart. So there seems to be, you know, other interesting probes of chaos. And if you want to understand what to say about them, you need to know not just about the energy statistics, but also about the statistics uh, of these things that are summed over here. So, so, so here you, you're speaking to two dimensions, right? This, what I wrote here, yeah, it would be for a two-dimensional CFT. You know, you, you can define these types of things in higher dimensions. Maybe they won't have a nice path integral representation on a smooth manifold, but you can still, you could, I can write the exact same formula in higher dimensions. And I think it still, it still converges. It's not gonna be a path integral on a nice manifold because you can't do a pair of pants decomposition. So it looks like a bunch of SD minus ones loose together with S, like with S1. It's a bunch of SD minus ones connected together in some weird way. Uh, it's probably a not a nice constant curvature manifold in any sense, but you can still formally define it. But, but you know, say for this talk, we can, we can restrict it to dimensions, in which case it has a very nice path integral representation. Um, okay, so this is like an interesting- Sorry, what is FT? Oh, it's the definition. It's the, this is a definition. Uh, I'm defining it as the product of two genus two partition functions analytically continued in this parameter beta. Okay. 
So it's a bit like the, 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 the usual spectral form factor, but it's different. It probes something else, some other probe of chaos. And, you know, it's completely unexplored. Good. So, so, so that's why, that's why you would want to, that's why you would want to care about these things. So uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Should, shouldn't this be a mixture of uh, all the products such that the total genus or something is uh, four? Uh, why is, why is the, why is the uh, genus two spectral form factor factorized over? I mean, I know that it's a definition, but still. Uh, oh, oh. I, I think you're, what you're asking is what's the difference between this and a genus four partition function? Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, so there's other objects that you actually, the, the relevant partition function is genus three. It also involves four heavy OPE coefficients, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, but the OPE coefficients are contracted in different ways. And so it, it's really something new. You know, just like the spectral form factor is the product of two partition functions. You can't get away with that. You can't write it as the partition function on some other manifold. It really is just a product. It's the same thing here. Maybe we can come back to that in a little bit when I talk about genus three partition functions. Um, okay, so so this is why you should care, uh, but but I really now want to go back to the OP randomness hypothesis and give you a little bit of evidence for it. Okay, and, and the evidence that I'll present um, will be related to figuring out that these non-Gaussianities are also suppressed. Okay, uh, and so this is about asymptotic formulas and the moments of CLMN, OK? Um, so you know, I said CLMN is a random variable. It should have some prefactor function of the energy or of the scaling dimensions times a random matrix. Uh, and it turns out that this function here, which really encodes like the Gaussian part, this is completely fixed by conformal invariance. And it's, what it's fixed by is really modular invariance of the genus two surface. Because the CFT should be modular invariant, that says that you know the sum of the OPE coefficient squared is some function f of delta, which is fixed. It's known. It's like basically e to the minus three pi, et cetera. Uh, so this is a little bit like this was worked out by Maloney and friends in a couple of papers. You can view this as a sort of generalization of Cardi's formula. So Cardi's formula is a statement, a universal statement about the asymptotic density of states in CFTs comes from modular invariance of the torus partition function. You can play the same game and look at modular invariance of the genus two partition function. And then you'll see that that constrains the uh, sum of OPE coefficients. Um, okay. So, um, so the Gaussian size of the thing is, is fixed by modular invariance, uh, but you can ask what about the, what about the, higher, what about the higher moments, okay? And for the OP randomness to be true, you would wanna show that at least the higher moments, you know, uh, are further exponentially suppressed in entropy. So one of the things that we did in, in a recent paper with, with, Jan and, with Jan and Diego is we looked at modular invariance um, of the genus G partition functions, okay? And you can decompose those in many channels. So I'll just write some of the examples of the things that we computed. There's one channel which is called, which we call the skyline channel because it looks a bit like New York. Okay, and you can do this many times. So each vertex here is an OPE coefficient, and this is telling you how they're traced together. Um, and if you look at you know, the size of this thing, the kth moment, uh, you get a function that looks like this. Okay, and this you should really compare with uh, what we had for, for, for ETH, the fournier kirchhoff argument, which was K minus one over K. And it looks very similar. There's different integers that appear here, which are five, four, and four. Like we couldn't predict those from first principles. They come from exploiting the Virzo crossing kernel and really, really being careful about modular inverse. Uh, but the structure is the same. As K becomes bigger and bigger, the higher and higher moments are further exponentially suppressed. Okay. 
Uh, and you can, you know, you can play a lot of other games. You can do the, what's called the COM channel, which is a different contraction of OBE coefficients. Uh, and in this channel, you also get a suppression, but the, the relative factors, uh, oops, the relative factors change, like 9K minus six over 8K. So again, things are further exponentially suppressed. Uh, but with a slightly different um, factor of suppression. And actually, there, it, actually, once you're a bit careful, it also depends on the lightest operator in the theory in some particular way like this. Okay, so what you can do is by exploiting, you know, higher genus modular invariants, you can check is, is something like the OP randomness hypothesis at least put potentially consistent. Um, and what you find is that the higher moments are further exponentially suppressed in the entropy uh, just like what you had in ETH. So at least it's, in some sense, it's not really a proof, but it's like a consistency check uh, that at least, you know, um, something like the ORH could be possible. Um, and another thing that you can do is uh, if you want to use random matrix theory, uh, you can construct an operator, a linear operator on the tripled Hilbert space, uh, whose matrix elements are the OPE coefficients. Uh, and then you can essentially randomize over this operator. Uh, and there's a way to, there's a way to derive, derive a version of ETH this way, where you, know, you start with some operator, you write it, it's in, then you look at inner products or matrix elements with the energy eigenstates. Uh, you'll, get, you'll get certain unitaries that map you from the eigenbasis of O to the basis of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and if you say that you're in a random matrix space, you might as well treat those as unitaries and you average over them. And then what you do is you, you reproduce the structure of ETH. Uh, and you can do the exact same thing here um, and show that you know, O is again, approximately a random operator. Or in other words, you assume that Rho is an approximately random operator. And then what you show using that is that the structure of these OPE coefficients is exactly like what you expect that there's uh, you know, there's a diagonal piece uh, plus a random matrix piece. Okay, um, so so that's sort of the the current evidence that that we have um, for the OP randomness hypothesis. Okay, since I'm I'm running out of time, time I, I want to just tell you a little bit about what we do with this and and why why it's interesting for gravity. So one thing that you can do then, once you have this OP randomness hypothesis is go and compute the square of a genus two partition function uh, in the CFT. Once again, if you do this microscopically, this should factorize, but we're not really gonna do it microscopically. We're gonna do it using the OP randomness hypothesis. Okay, Meaning that we treat the OBE coefficients as statistical objects. Uh, and what this thing looks like is, as I said, just a little bit before it has four OPE coefficients, and then it has, you know, these Boltzmann sums. And at the leading order, I said that C are Gaussian uh, random variables, so you can do just wick contractions with them. Okay, and there's two wick contractions. Uh, and so what you get if you do this, and I'm really skipping all the details because they're not, they're not important, um, but you get a factor like this, uh, so you get some term which is exponentially large in the central charge of the CFT. Um, and then you get another term which just looks something like this. Okay, it doesn't have a saddle. It's just some order one. This we can call an order one function. Uh, and this really comes, so the second term comes from the green wick contraction and the first term comes from the red contraction. Uh, and now you can ask, how does that compare with gravity? And in gravity, you have two types of solutions. So if our boundary conditions are two genus two surfaces, one of the solutions that you have is just to fill in each of the two genus two surfaces in some particular way. These are called handle body geometry. Okay, so you fill them in, you fill in some of the cycles here. Okay. Uh, and if you do that, you exactly get this answer here. Uh, and then, 
there's another type of solution, and you know where I'm going with this, which is a Euclidean wormhole called the genus two wormhole that was already discussed by Maus and Malvasena back then. Uh, and it turns out that this particular geometry has a vanishing on shell action. Uh, meaning that, you know, when you do e to the minus s on shell, uh, you'll get one. So you get an order one function. And, and this is exactly what we see here. And in fact, you might be, you might want to interpret this residual sum that we find kind of as a one loop determinant around the handlebar geometry. Uh, so what this is suggesting is that, you know, if, if you think that, you know, gravity is the, a statistical theory that knows just about the statistical distribution of the OPE coefficients, um, then you can, you know, you apply the OP, OP randomness hypothesis and that should mimic what gravity is calculating. And at the level of the genus two wormhole here, this seems to be the case. Okay, which is pretty exciting. So does that mean that the gravity approximation calculates the calculates these things? So if you really consider the quantum theory of gravity, if you consider higher corrections, it will calculate the higher moments. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about higher moments just uh, on the next slide. Uh, okay. But the idea is that, yeah, so, so I mean, gravity is the, the statement is gravity is the all moments calculation of um, of the the CFT thing that you're trying to compute. Yeah. That's so what I'm saying is, if you have yeah. a quantum theory of gravity like string theory, yes, does it mean that that computes the entire set of higher moments for the CFT side? Well, this is a bit of a subtle question. If you really think, you know, if you really think that. Um, AD, the ADS CFT duality is defined non perturbatively on both sides. Yeah. Then the full gravity string theory, non perturbative string theory, or string field theory computation that you do uh, on the gravitational side should be able to not only get the all moments, but actually get the, the actual fine grain structure. It should be able to compute the energy eigenstates. Yeah. We don't know if that's possible. Uh, personally, I'm not even sure that really, you know, the left-hand side of ADS-CFT, the, the gravity side of ADS-CFT, I'm not sure that's independently defined. The way I think about it is that you can, you know, define perturbative string amplitudes and so on and so forth. Um, and what the CFT does is uh, provide for you the non-perturbative definition of what you mean by quantum gravity. Okay. That's, that, that's my personal take. Um, but, but um, yeah, so if you, if you were capable of doing it in full string theory and, and that really is non-perturbatively defined, then you would be able to do better than just this. You would really reproduce the actual energy eigenlevels uh, and the individual OPE coefficients. And then you would you know, compute the, the square of the genus two partition function microscopically and you would not see any factorization puzzle. This, by the way, I didn't say this, but this is, you know, this is the factorization puzzle. This is what destroys factorization. And somehow the idea is that in string theory, you, you include this and many other things, or maybe you don't even include this. You only include strings and brains, and that's how things factorize. But okay, okay. I, I'm not gonna say this is speculation at this stage. Uh, I just, before I finish, I, I'm already over time. Um, I just wanna say uh, something about higher moments. Um, so you can ask, you know, we just, I, I showed you in some previous slide, the all, the all order moments, and you can ask, what happens if you take the quartic moments uh, and, and compute their contribution in here? Um, and so what happens if you do that, you look at the square of the genus two partition function and I'll take the one that's the most interesting, which happens to be the calm channel quartic moment. Um, then you get the following expression. Okay, and so you get uh, a, a saddle as long as the, so delta chi is the lightest field in theory and I'll say more about that in a second. Um, so this is quartic moments in the calm channel, uh, but you provided that the lightest operator is, is, is small enough, uh, you get an exponentially large saddle. Okay, which means that this is, so this is a saddle that's exponentially large in the central charge. It should be another geometry uh, that's actually much bigger than the genus two wormhole but that is still connected because it comes from a connected quartic moment. Okay, so this indicates that there's a new geometry 
that dominates over the genus two wormhole. Dominates over the genus two wormhole, uh, but nobody's found it yet. Um, so that that's quite interesting, and you can ask exactly how how you know how light does the operator need to be, and if you work out all the details, the dimension of the operator needs to be in the following way. Okay, so you have a saddle only provided that the operator is is lighter than this. Um, and you know, in well, so in pure gravity, if you call pure gravity the theory that has no light operators all the way to c over twelve then there would, be, there would not be such an operator and hence there would not be a large saddle and we don't expect a new geometry. Uh, so maybe that's why we haven't found it yet because we're looking you know, for solutions of pure 3D gravity and maybe it doesn't really exist in that case. It's, it's interesting to note that this thing here happens to be the scaling dimension of, uh, you know, there's conical defects in ADS-3. This happens to be the scaling dimension of a Z6 conical defect in ADS-3. Uh, I don't know if that's a phenomenolo phenomenological um, observation. I don't know if it's meant to be important or not, um, but it happens to be the case. Uh, but, you know, if in, in some top-down theory, like the D1-D5 CFT or, or some orbifold of it, of it, in which case the genus 2 wormhole can be made stable, uh, it seems to indicate that there should be a new geometry that dominates over the genus 2 wormhole that's connected that nobody has found yet. Um, and so I think it would be really interesting to try to find Anyway, I, I'm over that, uh, that the yeah. wormhole itself is of some genus. I mean, there could be a hole inside the wormhole yeah, may, itself. Yeah, maybe there, there's some weird thing happening with topology yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the structure of hyperbolic three manifolds is quite complicated. The handle bodies and things like the genus two wormholes are the simplest versions of them. Uh, mathematicians are pretty interested in this question. So maybe they know the answer, but they haven't written in a way that we were able to extract whether something like this exists and what its action would be. There are terms that's just, the action is just a regularized volume. So, so and it's something that they study, uh, but it would be interesting to find it. So, so just to sum up, what, what I tried to, to argue today is that, you know, semi-classical gravity is a very smart theory. It knows a lot, way more than what we thought originally. It knows more than just the black hole entropy and about thermal two-point functions. It, it has all this wormhole information that encodes the statistical higher moments of the microscopic data. Um, and that, you know, what the way we should view semi-classical gravity is the theory of all of these moments, the theory of statistical distributions. That's not an exact way to, des to describe the microscopics. The microscopics really have discrete uh, and precise numbers that you can't really compute this way. Um, but knowing the moments, you really know a lot and you can, you know, uh, start partially resolving the information paradox thanks to these things. Um, but you don't know the full answer. And that's why you see a lack of factorization because you're not doing a microscopic calculation. You're doing a calculation using the all moment, um, you know, the all moment statistical distribution. Um, and so I gave you a bit of evidence for the OP randomness hypothesis and, and told you uh, a little bit how it applies to, to, to gravity. But let me just stop here and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Alex, for the great talk. Um, so are there any more questions for Alex? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first of all, that was a very nice talk, Alex. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so when, you, when you're talking about uh, semi-classical gravity, right? So you're talking about uh, gravity on this three-dimensional manifold whose boundary uh, theory is given by some two-dimensional CFT, right? Yeah. And um, so I guess my question is that what can this uh, discussion tell us about, uh, you know, gravity in four dimensions? Yeah, good. So it's true that I, I should have said a little bit uh, more, more about that. Uh, in the end, the calculations I did here on these last two slides are for ADS-3 CFT2, uh, but the general framework that I this hypothesis is much more general. Um, so um, the idea would be that you can, you know, apply all of this to, you know, ABJM, so ADS-4 CFT2, CFT3, ABJM, or N equals to 4 super young mills, and that at the structural level, it'll work the same way. Um, 
it's sometimes a little bit harder to find wormhole solutions in higher dimensions, but they, they also exist. So uh, the statement would be the same that, you know, these wormholes still encode the statistical property of, of, of the OPE coefficients. So yeah, right. like at the level of practical computations, I, I didn't present any one that applies directly to higher dimensions, but the hope is that the whole framework just completely follows through. But uh, so, so is there any evidence from the gravity side in higher dimensions? Um, you, you mean by evidence, you mean something where you can like take the OP randomness hypothesis, use formulas that you know, treat them statistically and reproduce some kind of uh, wormhole action or something like that? Yeah, I, I was just thinking that um, most of the evidence is in lower than three dimensions, right? The evidence about the fact that wormholes capture statistical properties of the CFT? Yeah, above three dimensions, nobody's really... Um, Okay, so here's the problem is that you also wanna be able to produce stable wormholes, right? Wormholes that are at least perturbatively stable with respect to the load, to the pr propagating gravitational fields. For you to do that, um, it's tricky. It's easy, it's trivial in two dimensions. It's a little tricky in three dimensions. It becomes hard in higher dimensions. It, it's not impossible. So there was a paper by Santos and Marolf recently that wrote down a, a plethora of wormholes in all kinds of dimensions that exist and checked which ones are stable. And there are plenty of those that are stable. Uh, nobody's really uh, sort of, you know, kernel transformed that to figure out what those wormholes are saying, saying about the statistical property of OPE coefficients in higher dimensions, but it could be done. It's just that nobody's done it. Um, so we hope to get there eventually. What do you think uh, this kind of framework will have to say about n equals, uh, n equals for super angles or even say, Finite temperature QCD. Yeah, okay. So, uh, well, for n equals to four, I think it has a lot to say because this whole structure, I mean, the conjecture is that this structure applies to strongly coupled n equals to four super animals. So, you know, maybe one day the bootstrap will be power, powerful enough to, to solve n equals to four or to solve it to good enough accuracy that we can actually check this thing here. Um, but that's a dream, but maybe it'll happen one day. And then we can check if this is true and we hope that it is. And then, you know, so it'll, it'll say a lot about n equals to four supreme mills. QCD is different because QCD has a scale, so it's not a CFT. So what I'm saying here about OPE coefficients can't literally be applied, but all of this is still true in QCD. The, the, the ETH and, you know, the random matrix theory, the spectral statistics of, of energy eigenstates in QCD, all of that should follow through. Uh, now, I don't know if we'll ever be able to. But, but, but don't you need large n for ETH? No, you don't need large n for ETH, no. You do not. You do need the thermodynamic limit, right? So it's important that you have many, many degrees of freedom. You need a large Hilbert space, but you don't need a large number of local degrees of freedom. So, you know, okay. ETH should apply to SU, you know, SU3 n equals to four superannuals. Right. There's no, it should, there's apply, no problem. It, it should apply to QCD as well because QCD yes. is a nonlinear theory and it's chaotic by fiat, right? Yes. That's right. So, um, yeah. So it, it has a lot to say ab about those. Of course, you know, the whole gravitational side of the story may not be nice because if n is small, then, you know, gravity is very quantum. So the gravitational side of the story, uh, may not really apply or be useful, but everything that I said about ETH and random matrix theory, that should apply to QCD all the same way. In some sense, that's the beauty of random matrix theory. It's maybe the, you know, maybe the strongest universality we ever had in physics. We like to talk about RG universality. It's already very powerful. This is even better. You know, there's 10 symmetry classes for random matrix theory and that's it. So every single quantum chaotic system can be put in one of those 10 symmetry classes. It's really, you know, beautiful and powerful universality. Um, and so, yeah, you know, all quantum systems, as long as they're not integrable, should be embeddable in this framework. Uh, I have I have a nice question. Like, so when we uh, motivate ETH and uh, random matrix ensemble and so on, and and it's also motivated from chaos and so on, is there a distinction between these university classes 
within this universality classes some distinction which we can make uh, which says the theory is maximally chaotic or something yeah very good so uh that's important to say is that the random matrix so the, the statement about universality in 10 classes is about the statistics of the hamiltonian the eigenvalues then there's 10 symmetry classes um and however once you start talking about eth there's much more not there, there's a lot more non-universality because you see these functions here and even the entropy that's non-universal right this is theory dependent. Uh, and the statement about out of time ordered correlation functions is that, well, that's about the quartic moment. So actually you, you need to look at this piece here. So this will be, this will be how you probe something like this. Um, and so, you know, the value of this quartic moment encodes the, the, the OTOP basically and the growth of the OTOP. And it's non-universal, it's allowed to be theory dependent. In fact, you know, in this paper by Fuani and Kirchan, uh, where they talk about non gaussianities that's what, really what they were interested in. They were trying to understand, you know, how does ETH mingle with out of time ordered correlation functions? And then they realize that you need non trivial higher moments. Uh, and, you know, just like the second moment, all the higher moments in ETH are allowed to be non universal. What, you, what is universal is the structure, not the actual functions that enter. Uh, so, so, on a related question, like in the holography side, there are also people who try to relate chaos to two point functions by these pole skipping kind of arguments, right? Is that yeah. any of those kind of uh, applicable at this level, at the level of ETH and, and how, how the say ETH for the two point function and uh, the two point moments and the four point moments and so on? Would you? Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, ha I hadn't thought about that. Um, so that's that's more like kind of like a hydro thing, right? So it's like you relate the four point O talk to some property about the stress tensor two point function on the black hole background, right? Um, right. Or, or the current two point function, or, or those yeah, types. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Um, two point functions. Yeah. So somehow I think the statement is that if you there's some connection between some type of fine grained structure in the RMN for the stress tensor, uh, it's related to the four point RMN for O. Right, so this is what would capture the OTOC. Uh, but if it's also encoded in the stress tensor two point function, it's also here. So, you know, somehow there's a, kind of, there's a kind of interplay between the two. And maybe this is not unrelated to what we were discussing earlier about crossing and implementing, you know, the OPE directly in ETH, but in some sophisticated way. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So, uh my last question uh, so uh, you're you're referring to one paper uh, but i couldn't quite catch the names of the authors oh the, the it's funny and Kershan. sorry i, I I've, I've written like no references on my slides uh, okay yeah. it's a very nice paper i i, I strongly recommend it okay. and uh finally uh when you are talking about uh conical defects in csc Right. Yeah. Uh, could could that be thought of as uh, could the presence of defects uh, be treated as the presence of matter? Yeah. Good. So um, yeah. So the statement with the following is that for you to have this new wormhole saddle that hasn't been found yet, um, you need to have an operator with this scaling dimension, right? Mm -hmm. And the bound just happens to be the weight of a Z six conical defect. Uh, if you have any kind of standard matter in ADS, you know, where the mass is of order the ADS scale, then you satisfy this bound by a lot. This is a Planckian bound, right? This just says that, you know, if you have, um, now say you have no matter at all in the bulk, uh, then the only thing that becomes tricky is if you want to say, my theory is a theory of pure gravity. Uh, if you, by pure gravity, you mean nothing up to black holes, then you have no new saddle. But if you say, I do want to allow all the conical defects, which is not really matter, but it's kind of singular geometries, mm -hmm. uh, then you have a new saddle. Mm -hmm. And if you want to call pure gravity, you know, all the pure gravity, but that only starts at conical defect seven and upwards, then you would not have a saddle. So it depends a little bit what you want to mean by pure gravity. But any type of ordinary matter, so if I put a scalar field on ADS, or if I look at the KK reduction of ADS3 cross S3, 
that'll satisfy this bound by a lot. No. Okay. So, so is that evidence against um, the existence of a dual of pure gravity or? No, not really. I, I don't see it this way. I, I would say the following way. Either you go look for the solutions in gravity and you never find them, which would be evidence against the OP randomness hypothesis. It means that somehow we're doing something wrong or this thing that we find has to cancel against something else, or I don't know. Uh, or it's simply indicating that there's a new solution to the equations of motion um, that, that are there, but we haven't found it yet. And um, yeah, how it mingles with pure gravity, I don't quite understand. But somehow, if you take pure gravity and you have no conical defects, there shouldn't be a solution. But if you add in the conical defects, the conical defects might su support the solution. So I, I don't know exactly. I think the fact that the lightest dimension operator enters means that the wormhole has to be matter supported in some way. I don't know what that means exactly, but you know, you need to have matter somewhere in the wormhole. But that's all, that's all I can say. On a somewhat yes, different I, note, yeah. uh, this QCD, when uh, you convert it into a random matrix model, I mean, by considering the matrix elements of various operators between different energy eigenstates, that itself gives a gives an n, n by n matrix which is infinite dimensional, right? So that already is a large n theory. In, even in even for QCD, you have you end up with a large n theory, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, we, we should distinguish two things. There, one, which is the dimension of the Hilbert space. Maybe let's call that D, and, yeah. and what we call typically n in holography, which is not the dimension of the Hilbert space. It's the number right. of local degrees of freedom. That's what I'm uh, saying. Uh, yeah, and it, in an ordinary quantum system, you know, whether QCD or a spin chain, you know, if you make the spin chain large enough, the dimension of the Hilbert space goes to infinity. In QCD, yeah. because it's a QFT, the dimension of the Hilbert space is infinity to start with. Right. So, so you're 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 perfectly set to do RMT and, and ETH, and you just need to pick a microcanonical band with enough states in them, and that's it. Exactly. Exactly. That's what absolutely. I'm saying. Yeah. Absolutely. Are there any more questions for Alex? Yeah, just maybe a technical thing. So in, in this genus two wormhole, uh, the prediction from this OIH, you had this e to the minus six beta delta. So, so this sum, this sum of, like, can you reproduce it from the gravity side? No, no, this is, that's a great question. So uh, the way I view this is that, you know, say I had something like this, e to the, um, I don't know, square root of delta with some positive coefficient, right? Say I have something like this. Now this equation has a saddle point, right? Which gives you a large action. The wormhole, the, the genus two wormhole is the case where this, it, the coefficient becomes exactly zero. So you have one. So you no longer have a saddle point, uh, which means oh, yeah, that okay. you know, the on-shell action vanishes, but you shouldn't really trust this square box um, what, what it should just tell you is that you're, you're at the threshold case where there's no large on shell action. So if you really want to compute the actual green box here, you have to look at subleading terms and, and so on and so forth. And that's the same stated statement as saying that, you know, once the on shell action vanishes, you should really compute the one loop determinant here. You know, so you should put fields that propagate and compute their one loop determinant. And the hope is that, you know, if you were able to compute this one loop determinant here and also able to accurately compute this green box, that then you would find a match between the two. So that's something that we still need to do. It's a, it's a bit hard. The, 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 the hard part is on the gravity side, not really on the green box. It's, it's really it's not easy to compute these, these one loop determinants. Continuing on, continuing on my previous question, uh, for the large n, uh, since since even QCD ultimately becomes a large n theory, so uh, the statement that you made previously that the gravity should be uh, strongly coupled doesn't hold, right? I mean, you still have the semi-classical approximation to hold even for QCD, right? Uh, no, it's a, I think it's a bit subtle. So um, what 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 is required for gravity to be semi-classical is not just to have a large Hilbert space, right? Uh, sorry, yeah, it's not just to have a large Hilbert space. No, it it's really a large in theory. It's a large in theory. But but QCD is not a large in theory, right? QCD the, is not a large in theory, but the random matrix model is a large in theory. 
Yeah, 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 but very, oh. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. So maybe I can say it the following way. Once you enter the random matrix space, um, it doesn't really matter too much where it came from, whether it was from a large N theory, whether it was from a small N theory, but with many states, you know, all sure, of that that's has- what I'm saying. Yeah, all of that has been sort of washed away. So there are random matrix properties of, you know, QCD that you could explain with gravitational pictures. Because, you know, once you're in the random matrix phase, all theories kind of are the same. Yeah. Um, and so there, there's actually a very nice way to think about this. So there's a paper by Sonner and Atlans where they de develop, I, I didn't have time to talk about this today, but they develop a, an effective field theory of quantum chaos, which, you know, is a sigma model on some space. Uh, and that's completely universal and works for all systems. And then you can start, you know, really drawing 2D gravity pictures with wormholes and so on and so forth that applies that, that, you know, is sort of the effective description of that sigma model. And that should apply to QCD in the same way. So yes, in, in some sense, you know, there are some questions that you can ask in QCD that you'll be able to answer with gravity drawings, uh, but they may not be of the same type as the, the literal wormhole that I'm drawing here. In, in other words, you know, maybe, maybe I can write it here, maybe this, if I put a box here, you know, maybe this picture works exactly the same way in QCD. Once you're in the ramp phase, there's like an effective 2D geometry, which is the cylinder that captures the ramp. And that's true even in QCD. Um, the difference with gravity is that gravity, you know, you can start going back earlier in time uh, where you exit the random matrix phase, then QCD will start looking very different than other theories. Um, and, you know, maybe gravity also, wormholes also tell us about this transition phase here. But this is not known, okay? So this is now speculation, but maybe wormholes also have something to say about this here. This is the non-universal phase. So I'm not sure if, if I answered your question, but... Yeah, more or less, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think you're right is that there's an effective gravitational picture that applies to the very, very late times, which is the ramp region. Uh, if you go back earlier in times, now everything is theory dependent. So it, it starts caring whether you're in N equals to four superior mills at large N or QCD. Um, and so here in QCD, we expect that there's gonna be no nice gravity picture that describes this, this ashed moment of time. Uh, but maybe in n equals to four, there still is some intermediate regime where, where you're not in the universal phase, but still wormholes are telling you something about theory. But the point is that it becomes chaotic almost instantaneously. So I don't see why there should be any phase at all it, it, in which it is not chaotic. No, no, no. It's chaotic right away, but that doesn't mean that it's universal. So, you know, the statement of a random matrix universality is a statement of eigenvalue repulsion between nearby eigenvalues. Once you explore the property of eigenvalues far away in the bands, that's not universal. So the thing is still chaotic. You know, the distribution will look roughly like a semicircle and so on and so forth. So there's still chaos, but the, you know, the, 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 this, this, this thing here is true, uh, you know, only for, you know, EN minus EM is like, you know, I don't know, 10 times e to the minus S, right? Say a few level spacings. If you go to if you go to to, to to things that are you know very far away in the microcanonical window, this formula is not no longer true, and it gets corrected by a lot of stuff, and it, it gets corrected by theory dependent quantities. And and that's you know. In in this graph here, now I'm drawing too many things on top of each other, but in, in this graph here. There's there's a kind of moment usually called the Thales time where you're entering random matrix space. Everything after random matrix phase is universal, but before that, it's not. And in fact, using the sigma model, you can study deviations from universality. And those will care very much about whether your theory is QCD or, or a holographic CFP. Okay. Uh, do you think it's possible to test the ORH uh, numerically? Yeah, that's, a, that's also a great question. Um, in, in theory, yes. In practice, no. 
so I've, I've been having conversations with the bootstrap people. I think so. I think the sort of state of the art, you know, in finding like, you know, the most precise scaling dimensions for the Ising model are found with the bootstrap, right? Um, so you can try to ask, can you solve for the OPE coefficients of the first few operators in the theory? And, you know, they can get very good bounds on a few of them, but we're asking about the thermodynamic limit here. So, you know, we need to ask about a scaling dimension of dimension, I don't know, 10,000 or something like that. That's so far beyond anything they can do right now. Yeah. So maybe one day, but the bootstrap is pretty far from that right now. Does this have anything to say about black hole microstates and entropy? Microcanonical, -canon I mean, the calculation of the microscopic entropy? Uh, yeah, so I mean, well, okay, so good. Uh, I mostly talked about uh, operator statistics that today, so I didn't talk too much about the higher point moments of rho itself, um, which is, I think, what, what you're asking. You, you want to know about you know, the actual microstates. Um, so the entropy is known. That's the one point function. You get it from the black hole horizon. And there's all the higher moments. And, and those are an important part of the story. Uh, I focused on the operator statistics, but you would really want to incorporate also all the statistics of the energy levels in some unified way, which is not really done here. Um, you know, in some sense, you know, the eigenvalue statistics is fixed by random matrix theory, and then the operator statistics is fixed by ETH. And I did the ETH part of the story for CFTs, and then there's also the random matrix of the energy levels. Um, and I didn't discuss that too much today, but one should really do a sort of more unified framework that does both. Okay. Nice talk, by the way. Thanks. I'm sorry for going over time. No, it's fine. Uh, I think we had nice discussion. Um, are there any last questions, maybe? If not, uh, let's, let's all thank Alex again for the great talk and discussion. Thank you, thank you Alex. Thanks a lot. And uh, hope to see you physically yeah, someday. <laughs> Are you, are you going to the Amsterdam workshop this summer? Or? I'll probably go to US Strings next year in France. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I might, be, I might be there as well. Okay, okay, great. Awesome. Thanks um, a lot. All right, thanks guys. Have a good day. Well, good afternoon for you, I guess. Yeah, afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Have a good day. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye.